a massive welcome to everyone that's uh, come along today. It's great to have you all here. Um, we're really excited for Professor Steve Keane's uh, presentation on the appallingly bad neoclassical economics of climate change. Um, the structure of today is going to be about 25-30 minutes of presentation before we open up to questions from you guys. So please feel free to submit them using the Zoom Q&A function. Uh, if you see someone's asked a similar question to one you were going to ask, just upvote that one and then we'll try and get around to kind of the most popular questions. Uh, and then after today, we're hosting a coffee session, which is kind of like a more informal session where you guys can come along uh, in a Zoom meeting format if you want to uh, and just kind of socialise and discuss what we've just heard and all things rethinking economics. So I definitely recommend coming along for that. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll just introduce Roberta, who's today's kind of tech person. So if you guys have any questions, please submit them to her using the chat and um, we'll try and troubleshoot those for you. Uh, and I'm Oliver. Uh, an undergrad student at Warwick studying economics. So yeah, that's all from me. Uh, without further ado, Steve, if you want to take it ahead. Sure, thank you. Okay, uh, let's see, I'm sharing the screen here. So that's actually that's not the one I want to share. It's this one. Okay, is that uh, visible to you all? Yep, that's visible. Good. By the way, I might remember a bit of a plug for something coming out pretty shortly. Uh, the book you can see in the top uh, right hand corner here, Funny Money, is a cartoon book I've written with, uh, uh, with uh, Miguel Guerra from Seven Robots, and that should be out in about a month or two's time. Not sure of the pricing. It's going to be very cheap because I'm not taking any royalties and neither is Miguel, but it's an attempt to get across the points about the nature of money in a cartoon format rather than trying the serious stuff. But today what I'm going to talk about is uh, Economics Out of Equilibrium, which I think is a great title you've got for your overall uh, presentation series. And I wanted to actually start on the whole issue of economics and equilibrium and how we economics got into the state it is before I start talking specifically about the appalling work that neoclassicals like Nordhaus have done on climate change. And starting with a very general question, how do we exist? How does society exist? Well, one way to answer it, we, we wouldn't exist unless we're exploiting the free energy we find in the universe. Uh, uh, we, without that energy, and we've got reserves of energy obviously mainly fossil fuels that we're exploiting to give us a society where the average energy of the society, the elements of society are higher than the average energy of the environment, but lower than the average energy of the reserves we're working with as well. So what you have is reserve, which of course we've taken from the environment. We've found oil and then made it into a, a reserve rather than just a, a large puddle of fluid under the ground. Um, and if they, Without that energy flow, a continuous flow of energy taken from the reserves, exploited to create society, and then the waste, both energy and matter, dumped into the environment. Without that, we wouldn't have an economy to begin with. So this particular flow is absolutely vital to have a human society. And the gap between us and the environment is also essential. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, we the resources are part of the environment. We take them out and focus them and then exploit that energy flow to enable us to have a civilization. So if we were in equilibrium with the environment, we wouldn't have a society at all. Okay. So the question is, you know, why this focus upon equilibrium? Now, if you look at the, the focus I've made upon energy, I want to elaborate a bit more on that front. And the, um, uh, this, this graph, I've, I've actually in the, the uh, labels of the different axes, I've included the source data set so people can go and check them out for themselves. But you can see a fairly obvious trend between world GDP and world energy. Of course, the trend, both things rising, doesn't tell you all that much. Um, but what, when you then look at the relationship between the change in energy and the change in GDP over the period of which we have annual data uh, rather than the, the data which, which was mainly by a decade, you get this incredibly tight correlation between the two. I don't go into great detail in this presentation about you know, analyzing that or, or using it as a modeling basis, but the correlation between change in energy and change in GDP is 0.8. And the, then the change is pretty much one for one. A 1% 1 change in GDP means a 1% change in energy. Very, very close to that level. When you, and when you graph it, um, we're rather than getting a sort of curve relationship that neoclassicals think is really cool to have between resources and, uh, and output using the concept of diminishing marginal productivity, you get a very strong straight line relationship 
between the amount of energy measured in the bottom down there in millions tons of oil equivalent and the amount of GDP measured on the vertical in billions of US, uh, US $2,010. So there's a very tight relationship between energy and GDP, which is the point of that first chart. So we exist as a civilization because we exploit the energy that we find in the environment. And doing that, we maintain a gap between ourselves and the biosphere, which is a far from equilibrium gap. If we actually fell back to equilibrium, we'd just be another great ape, pulling bananas out of trees okay, and being part of the overall biosphere. So why this fetish with equilibrium? Where did it come from? And I'd argue that over time, what has happened, it's, it's morphed from something which was a, an abstraction to enable some level of modeling in the 19th century to a religious belief about nature of capitalism in the 20th and 21st. And if you look at some people like Jevons, who was one of the world's polymaths, as well as one of the founders of neoclassical economics, you see his awareness that we should be using dynamic, fundamentally non-equilibrium, he calls it statics, but it's really also non-equilibrium thinking. I was using dynamics and non-equilibrium rather than statics and equilibrium. He said the reason we use statics, which we would now call, which I now call equilibrium thinking, is because it's easier to do. And in the writing at the end of the, the, uh, the 19th century, looking at the arrival of the 20th, J.B. Clark, who's the, the neoclassical who gave us the marginal product theory of income distribution, wrote that he thought what's going to happen in the 20th is going from the static level of modeling to the dynamic. That was his confidence at the turn of the century. Now, of course, that didn't happen. And there's a, my favorite, probably my favorite author in economics, frankly, uh, is John Blatt, who's not an economist, but a mathematician. And he was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize for Physics in the, in the 1950s. He was the leading a developer and, and a popularizer as well of quantum mechanics. Um, and when he looked at economics, he was so horrified by how bad the analysis by neoclassical economists was, uh, not post-Keynesian, he had a lot more time for post-Keynesians. He made this throwaway line, or what I thought was a throwaway line, line, that capitalism as a social system may disappear before its dynamics are understood by economists. Now, of course, since then, we've had the development of dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models but I've emphasized the word equilibrium is still there. And this fetish for equilibrium is still extremely strong. Uh, this is V.V. Chari, who is a, a very prominent and very aggressive mainstream economist. Uh, and he was one of several people invited to speak to the US Congress about the failure of economics to predict the financial crisis. And his response was to very strongly defend its overall modeling uh, approach and saying, if you have a story that's interesting and and incoherent, you can tell it in a DSG equilibrium model. If you can't, your story is incoherent. So it still sees equilibrium as being absolutely central. But at the same time, or not long after, you can find a Nobel Prize winner coming out saying, macro has gone backwards. Rather than this stuff being in advance, it's actually so bad that he said, you can't even call it postmodern. You're better off calling it post real. So how the hell, how the hell we get into that situation? Well, I think, and this is actually something which Janis Varoufakis and Chris Asperger uh, reached a similar conclusion. I've actually published a paper on it as well. I've got all the references, by the way, at the end of the presentation. They describe neoclassical economics as a magnificent failure. And the failure is they tried to prove the, the, what they thought would be the, the results of static equilibrium modeling. And they failed every last time the, the attempt to model capitalism as, a, as an equilibrium system uh, in, a, in a static, uh, no change over time um, framework failed to do so. And what you then had was rather than taking those failures on board and then adapting their approach for the failure, uh, they continued making evasions to get around the failures and that use of equilibrium as, a, as an organizing principle turned across to, organize, to a belief in equilibrium being a fundamental characteristic of a capitalist society. So if you look at um, the, the very beginnings of mathematical economics, it was with Volra and the idea of a tetonement process where you would have uh, one room uh, in which everybody with all the, all the products which were for sale would arrive and an auctioneer would costlessly 
uh, set up a, a random set of prices. Uh, and then the determined process was to increase the price for commodities where, um, pardon my, I just actually started a message saying my internet connection is unstable. So I'll, I'll, I'll waffle until that goes away. Okay, uh, a process where you increase the price if there's too much demand in a particular market and reduce the demand, reduce the price if there's uh, too much supply in a particular market. And he believed that this process would gradually force the list of prices to be in equilibrium set and then and only then would trade be allowed to occur. Now, would that converge? Of course, if it doesn't converge, you'd never have trade. Well, what's known as the peron frobenius theorem proved that this vector is unstable. And the, again, it's a, it's a lengthy explanation as to why, but John Blatt's book, uh, which has just been republished, by the way. Um, uh, you can find it on Amazon. I highly recommend it to any of you who want to get a really deep look into the flaws of neoclassical economics and the potential uh, for alternative approaches. Over those four chapters, he explains why that determined process does not work why you don't converge to equilibrium. And well, how did neoclassicals react to that? Well, this is uh, one of the leading papers from the neoclassical point of view. He said, oh, well, if you restrict the initial values of the disequilibrium variables, we can get away from getting, ending up with, non -neg uh, with negative values for things like prices. Now, that's saying if we, the world starts from a particular point, it'll never get into trouble. I'm sorry, it didn't start from that point. We're in trouble. So this is just a nonsense piece of logic. He also makes mathematical errors, which Black points out in that, uh, in that exposition. So uh, rather than saying, well, the price system must be a non-equilibrium system, they impose assumptions to force it to sit within the equilibrium framework. Uh, these days, uh, the, the multi-sectoral, multi-commodity analysis that Volra developed, which became the basis of what we call computable general equilibrium models back in the uh, 60s, 70s, and to the middle of the 80s. Some of them still exist, but the dominant stuff now is this idea of a, a single commodity model with equilibrium through time based on the Ramsey growth model. Is that stable? Well, the answer is no. This is no, this is part of the part of the paper back in 1928. Ramsey showed that his his model had an unstable equilibrium called a, a saddle point equilibrium. Now a saddle, uh, if you imagine trying to throw in, if you throw a ball bearing into a hat. Uh, or into a cone, it'll fall down to the bottom. That's, that's a stable system. If you throw it into a saddle, good luck trying to get it to sit on the bridge along the horse's spine. Um, so it's an unstable system, mathematically that's called unstable. But neoclassicals use that to say, well, we have these agents who are, happen to be able to see the future and therefore they've got this mathematical uh, uh, imaginative capability to work out where the saddle is and to leap onto it whenever it moves this location because of uh, random shocks, technology and preferences. And those uh, fluctuations up and down the spine of the saddle, that's what business cycles are. Uh, that became their solution. So when you show that the model itself doesn't stably push you towards equilibrium, just assume we're all God, simple really. So rather than accepting that all these things are non-equilibrium processes, they fudge all the results and use what they called simplifying assumptions to get themselves back to equilibrium again. And uh, just to give you an example of, of what these are like, uh, if you read the original, you don't find this in the textbooks, the textbooks tend to bury it. But here's one from Sharp, oh, sorry, this is Samuelson, pardon me. Um, Samuelson back in 1956, proving that a market demand curve has the same shape as an individual demand curve. Part of his argument, he assumed that before trade takes place, a benevolent dictator undertakes optimal relocations of income to keep the ethical worth of every person's dollar equal. So nobody's upset at all about the distribution of income. It's all been fairly worked out beforehand by a non-market actor. And that's supposed to be a model of capitalism. Sharp, when he modeled the efficient markets hypothesis, built a model of a single investor uh, with expectations about the future and with access to money at, a, at, a, at a, a riskless rate. And he, to then go across to the model for the entire market, he simply assumed what he called homogeneity of investor expectations. Investors are assumed to agree on the prospects for various investments, meaning you could never have a dinner party conversation 
about shares because you all agree with each other. And what's even better, you're all right. Now that's the basis of the efficient markets hypothesis. So that's why it's a load of cod swallow. Uh, and then here is De Bruyne. This, 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 these are all Nobel Prize winners, by the way. Uh, his De, Bruyne, De Bruyne's model, which became called Arrow De Bruyne a General Equilibrium, uh, had this element where he assumed that we producers know the future. And I love, I love the part I've highlighted here. The certainty assumption implies that he knows now what input output combinations will be possible in the future. Though he might not know the technologies involved. So you've got somebody today buying large amounts of helium uh, because it happens to be that in 3000 years time, his production process will use nuclear fusion. Um, fantasy is a kind way to describe these bizarre assumptions. But they're all justified by Milton Friedman's mad methodology. And this, again, all these papers are ones that you should be able to find in, in the literature. I've given the links to them at the end of the um, presentation. And to defend making absurd assumptions like that, Friedman argues that truly important and significant hypotheses will be found to have assumptions that are wildly inaccurate descriptions, descriptions of reality. And the more significant, the more unrealistic assumptions. And that's what Friedman actually called the F twist. Oh, hang on a second. The neighbor calling, I can't actually answer. Um, so I'll have to give him a call back. Okay. Uh, and the, here is Steve Friedman's justification. Uh, a hypothesis is important if it explains a lot by a little, which is fair enough for you to some extent. But he said, therefore, a hypothesis has to be descriptively false because it shows the other phenomena aren't important. Now, and then it is, this is where, the, again, the F-twist was, was brought in. Um, you can't assess the theory on the basis of assumptions. You simply have to see whether the theory makes reliable predictions. That's the mindset that neoclassical economists get drilled into, whether they read the stuff or not. Now, this only applies to what you can call, genuinely call, simplifying assumptions. For example, apparently this, um, uh, uh, mythical experiment didn't actually occur with Galileo, but it, another um, group of, of uh, scientists back in those days did actually do the whole thing of dropping out two lead balls out of a, out of a tower. But Galileo's assumption that he did this with a lean tower at Pisa, effectively he's assuming there's no air resistance at the height of the tower. Now, if you actually could somehow remove the air and then let the balls fall in a vacuum, it'd make very little difference. It's a simplifying assumption, so that's correct. So you can that you leave that out because it doesn't have much impact. But what neoclassicals apply um, Friedman's dictum to, or what a superb philosopher uh, Alan Musgrave called domain assumptions. And by domain assumption, he says a domain assumption is an assumption that determines the region of applicability of a theory. If the assumption is false, then so is the theory. Now, for example. And there's numerous examples in neoclassical economics, the ones I gave a moment ago being some of them. Uh, let's, if you assume, as mainstream economic theory does, that banks are just intermediaries, then you can reject the debt deflation theory of the Great Depression. And this is what uh, Ben Aki did back in uh, 2000 in his essays on the Great Depression. He explained pretty badly Irving Fisher's debt deflation theory, but then said it didn't have much impact upon the academic profession, meaning, of course, neoclassicals, not people like me, uh, because uh, debt deflation is no more than a redistribution from one group debtors to another group creditors. Now, that alone is worth a few, you know, goggle-eyed looks at. I thought when people went bankrupt, they didn't manage to repay the creditors. But anyway, he then said, absent implausibly large differences in marginal print spending propensities, pure redistributions should have no significant macroeconomic impacts. Now, why? is lending a pure redistribution because you assume that banks are intermediaries, not originators of debt. Now, if you look at the data, this throws his belief that there should be no significant macroeconomic impacts out the water. This is the unemployment level and the rate of change of private debt, which is credit, um, shown as a percentage of GDP, from 1920 to 1940. And the correlation between the two is minus 0.81. That, I think, without doing any stats on it, I'm pretty happy to say that's significantly different from zero. And if you look at the data today, it's much the same. Uh, it's actually more obvious 
but it's very tightly correlated. They have much the same numerical level for it. So the empirical data wildly contradicts his domain assumption and his domain assumption is false. Okay. What his assumption is that banks are just intermediaries. If they were, then credit wouldn't matter. Since they're not, and thank God the Bank of England, I can now quote the Bank of England in that paper to say banks are originators of money and debt, not intermediaries, then credit does matter. So domain assumptions do matter. They tell you whether your theory is applicable or not applicable. But in neoclassical economics, rather than being aware of this, they still pump out this, you can't judge the theory on its assumptions, defense of the absurd assumptions that are an integral part of neoclassical economics. And of course, when it comes to refereeing, referees will pass stuff that makes these assumptions, even if there's obviously something absurd about them, like for example, assuming that all investors agree on the prospects of all stocks. Nobody said, hang on a second, that's clearly wrong. Oh, it's just a simplifying assumption. Even Sharp himself said three years after it that that theory is, assumption is violated, quote unquote, the theory is in a shambles. That is not a simplifying assumption. What happens is they end up passing papers like Nordhaus's that make absurd assumptions about climate change because they think we can't test it on the basis of the assumptions. And therefore this stuff gets published and then it becomes an established part of mainstream economic theory. So if you look at the conclusion that, uh, that, that uh, Nordhaus reached, if you check his Nobel Prize lecture out, he's, his optimal path for the economy and the ecology would give us a four degree increase in temperature over pre-industrial levels. These are a number of time path predictions out of the, the so-called DICE model, depending upon whether you have abatement or not and how fast you try to abate the effects and so on. There's his optimal time path at its maximum in terms of the uh, increase in temperature. And that's four degrees by 2150. He reckons it's going to be optimal. And then speaking, writing shortly after that in one of the American Economic Association journals, he said the damage equation in his model assumes damages of 2.1% of GDP at three degrees and 8.5% of GDP at six degrees of warming, six degrees above. Now that's a 2.1 to an 8.5% fall in GDP relative to a world in which there's no climate change at all. It's not saying growth's gonna fall by that much per year. It's saying at 2150, we're going to see something of a, uh, between a 2.1 and 8.5% fall in GDP compared to what it would have been if there was no climate change at all. Now, the same sort of stuff comes out of the IPCC. Why? Because neoclassical economists are the ones who get invited to write the economic sections of the IPCC report. And they said that by 2100, they expressed, we, they, we, we express, expect about a two degree increase in temperature and a loss of between 0 0.2 and 2% of GDP, again, compared to what it would have been in the complete absence of climate change, which means a drop in the rate of growth of about 0.01% uh, per year. It's trivial. And then uh, when you see all the studies that the, that the neoclassicals have put together into the IPCC, uh, you get things like, as I'll just show you here, this is, I'm looking at my, my, my mouse to work here, a one degree in temperature increase. One of them predicted a two and a half percent increase in GDP out of that one degree increase in temperature. Another one had about a 0.1% fall. Then you have these various predictions here. You get out to three degrees and most of them are between a zero and a 3% fall in GDP, even a five and a half degree increase in temperature, the prediction is a 6% fall in GDP. So they're predicting trivial damages from climate change. Now, where do these dots come from? Well, they all come from studies by economists. And those studies make various assumptions which are very typically neoclassical. Effectively, anything indoors will be unaffected by climate change. That's one of them. We can use today's weather and GDP data to predict the impact of climate change. And in case anything goes wrong, market can cope with anything. So it doesn't matter what we throw at the climate, the market will rapidly adjust to it. And there won't be any climate tipping points for more than three centuries. Now, the first one anything done under cover. 
will be unaffected by climate change. Um, and this is Nordhaus from 1991. He's saying the most sensitive sectors of uh, agriculture and forestry, which depend upon climatic variables, it depends upon the weather. Okay, calling this a big mistake in mistaking the climate for the weather. He said at the other extreme, activities taken in carefully controlled environments won't be directly affected. And he then said our estimate, meaning it was the Royal Owl, uh, about 87% of GDP will be unaffected by climate change. Now, you, you, when you start, you know, 87%, you take a look at the table that he puts together and here's these things, negligible impact. You're simply assuming manufacturing and mining, by which he means underground mining, of course, uh, 26% of GDP won't be affected. Just an assumption. Transport and communication is not on the, on, the, on the water, five and a half. Finance, insurance, and the balance of real estate, anything not coastal, Mara logo might get affected. Uh, that comes out at 11%. Trade and other services, this is retail and wholesale trade, 28% of GDP. Government services, even the rest of the world, the assumes will be unaffected by climate change. It's simply an assumption. Now, you might hope that other economists would come along and say, hang on, you can't simply assume that. Oh no, they repeated it. This is from the IPCC 2014. For most economic sectors, the impact will be small relative to other drivers. And notice this, this is a very conventional language in the IPCC. Uh, each of the committees will say the level of evidence and the level of agreement. Medium evidence, high agreement. In other words, there's no dissenting voices in this group of economists. In other words, they're all neoclassical. Changes in population, age, income, technology, relative prices, lifestyle, regulation, and many other aspects of social development will have an impact that is large relative to the impact of climate change. Now, you know what politicians are like. They get a huge report like the RPCC. Which section do they get their staff to read? The economic section. What does it tell them? Ignore it. If you're wondering why politicians don't take serious action on climate change, one of the reasons is neoclassical economics. I love this one, frequently asked questions. Are other economic sectors vulnerable to climate change too? The answer, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and notice mining is included now because they realized after 1991 that most mining these days is open cut. Are exposed to the weather and thus vulnerable to climate change. So climate equals weather. Other economic activities such as manufacturing and services take place in controlled environments and are not really exposed to climate change, otherwise known as the weather. Next assumption they made that you could use data we have today on temperature and GDP to predict the impact of climate change. And when I first read, this is the first time I realized just how shockingly bad their work was, that they made this absurd assumption. And that was the basis of the trivial predictions you see uh, of the economic impact of climate change. Uh, estimates of the welfare of impacts using observed variations across space within a single country in prices and expenditures to discern the effect of climate. So we assume that the observed variation over space holds over time as well. I was just in shock when I read that. It was so stupid. So what they did was they took regional temperature and income data, they produced a scatter plot, they fitted a normally fitting a quadratic, sometimes slightly higher order polynomial, fitting a quadratic to the data, and then use that quadratic to impact us, predict what's going to happen with climate change. Now, this is the sort of stuff they were using. So I, I mocked this up in about half an hour, which by the looks of it is worth a Nobel Prize for me, since Nordhaus got one for his. So those are the data points. The bottom, the horizontal axis is the deviation of temperature uh, each, by each state on the US average, the average is 11 and a half degrees Celsius. Um, so those are uh, you know, temperature variations from North Dakota to Florida. And then the gross state product uh, per capita and the deviation from the uh, average for that. And then if you, can, if you look at it, there's no, no relationship there. But if you, you push your luck, well, there's, there's more on the bottom than there are on the top. Um, and there's a bit of a curvature to the data. So maybe, maybe a quadratic uh, would, make, would sort of fit it. And they, that's what they did, put a quadratic through there. And I've just did this in a couple of minutes. And I got a correlation coefficient between the data 
and a quadratic of 0.31, which is not dreadful, uh, but it's not particularly impressive. Now, they, and what the equation came out of it, the change in GDP as a function of the change in, in temperature Celsius compared to pre-industrial will be minus 0 0.00318 times temperature squared. So if you have a, a two degree increase in temperature, you get about a, a point, about a 1% fall in GDP. That's the basis of it. And you look at right out here, uh, whereabouts are we? Yeah, 10 degree increase in temperature going to cause about a 25% fall in GDP. This, this, by the way, four degrees is roughly the level of temperature uh, below pre-industrial levels at the, uh, in the, in the ice age. So the prediction for an ice age would, an ice age will reduce GDP by about 5%. So there's your temperature deviation from the average. There's your GDP variation from the average, according to this simple load of nonsense I, I mocked up. Now they then use a very similar function, in fact, with a lower level for the coefficient to predict the damages from climate change. And then the, another method they used to build these, drive these numbers that trivialized climate change with surveys of experts. Lord House did too. This is possibly the least objectionable because at least he asked some scientists, uh, but most of them were economists like Larry Summers, who as we all know is an expert on the climate. Um, and there are only three genuine scientists in this group. And when, when he asked the economists what they thought about the impact of climate change, this is the sort of answer they gave. The degree of adaptability of human economies is so high that for most scenarios, the impact of global warming would be essentially zero. Just like the impact of COVID has been essentially zero. Uh, and then economist explains energy and brain power, the only limits with sufficient quantities we can adapt to uh, develop new technologies so as to prevent any significant economic costs. So nothing's gonna really happen. And then finally, uh, economists don't know much about natural ecosystems. That's bloody true. And natural scientists know equal little about the incredible adaptability of human societies. This, of course, is all before the global financial crisis and clearly before COVID. Uh, and they actually accused scientists of not understanding the role of technology, which I just find hilarious. Now, one scientist refused to answer the key question that Nordhaus posed to the survey. Remember, there are only three. The total number of people in the survey is 19, 10 of whom are economists, eight of whom Nordhaus himself classified as not being experts on the climate. But he just added all the numbers together. But he only added 18 rather than 19 numbers because one person refused to give them a, a guess as to what would happen to GDP with a three degree or a six degree increase in global temperatures. And this person came back, I think a beautiful retort, which the one thing I'll give Nordhaus credit for is he actually wrote this down in the journal. I marvel that economists are willing to make quantitative estimates of economic consequences of climate change when the only measures available are estimates of global surface average increases in temperature. Very carefully stated this. As one who spent his career worrying about the vagaries of the dynamics of the atmosphere, I marvel that they can translate a single global number an extremely poor surrogate for a description of the climatic conditions into quantitative estimates of impact on global economic conditions. So he simply refused to answer the questions. Now, the other two scientists did answer the question along with all the economists and a couple of other social scientists. And the, the range was enormous. Talking about the three degree increase in temperature, the predictions raised from zero impact to 21%. Now, when you look at it, the two climate scientists were up here at the 21% on average. The economists were down here at the zero, or 1.9. Uh, it, it's just, it is, but what he publishes is an average of everybody. So you dilute the views of the scientists who actually have got some idea of what they're talking about by adding in the views of Larry Summers, who at one stage, his comment on biodiversity was he didn't care about ants except for drugs. I wish a few ants would bite him. Now, the thing which I found most shocking, and I'm pleased to say I'll be publishing a paper with this uh, scientist shortly on this issue. Uh, Nordhaus assumed there were no tipping points, and this is a flagrant misrepresentation of the scientific literature. Because what he uses as a damage function is a simple quadratic. At the moment, his quadratic says the damages from climate change are equal to 
point zero zero two two seven, I think it is, zero zero two two seven times the temperature change over pre-industrial level squared. That's it. Very, very flat and very, of course, of an inherently smooth quadratic. Now, in his manual for dots, he mentions, of course, there are no sharp thresholds or tipping points, but he says this is consistent with the Sevo by Lenton. Now, when I saw that, my first reaction was, I don't think this is true. I just can't accept that. So I went to look in his bibliography for Lenton. There was nothing by Lenton in his bibliography. So I went searching on the web and I found a paper for Lenton 2008. And that was the one that he was talking about. In 2013, uh, again, the same thing happened. He published this paper. I don't think he has a book called The Climate Casino. And in chapter five of that, he talked about surveys of tipping points. And he said a particularly interesting one by Lenton and colleagues. He must have read it, you think. Uh, and they said, their review finds no critical tipping elements with a time horizon of less than 300 years until global temperatures have increased by at least three degrees Celsius. Oh, we're in the clear. Nothing going to go wrong for three centuries and we've got to get three degrees one with the R now. Piece of cake, not a problem. Now, I'm not a child, but I'm tempted to women like one right now. I call this a fucking lie. Pardon, a child wouldn't use the word fucking, would they? Damn. This is his table summarizing Lenton in the book. Tipping element, Arctic sea ice at the top there, as you can see. Sahara, Amazon, Atlantic thermohaline solution, uh, circulation, blah, blah, blah. Time scale, so not how long it's going to take till it happens, but what, what is the characteristic time scale for this particular process? The level of warming that may cause trouble and level of most concern. Well, that's, that's, that's a reassuring one. So here's Arctic summer sea ice. Let's take a look at it. So, less than three degrees Celsius. Yes. Okay, between point zero point five and two. Less than 300 years. Yes. So what's the missing element? Oh, it's not critical. Level of most concern, just a single asterisk. Thank God for that. Thank God Lenton told us not to worry about summer sea ice. The only problem is Lenton did not tell us not to worry about summer sea ice. Lenton described it as the biggest threat we face. There's no such column in Lenton's research. No such level of concern column. Nordhaus just made it up and put it in his own book. And in fact, when you read Lenton, you find he describes Arctic summer sea ice as the greatest and clearest threat that we face. Here's the actual table in Lenten. Notice also, of course, Arctic summer sea ice at the top. Let's take a look at look there. So you can see the range of temperatures, the time scale, and this thing called critical values. Now, if I'm going to be generous to Nordhaus, and believe me, I'm not inclined to be generous to him, maybe he misinterpreted the fact that it says unidentified there to say it's not critical. Maybe. Maybe that's possible. But that little hash there is explained down here. Meaning theory, model results, or paleo data suggest the existence of a threshold, but we don't have a number for it. That's all they meant by that. We haven't identified it yet. Not that it wasn't critical to the climate. So as I said, a child would call that uh, a daddy word lie. But if you, if you read Lent, I, mean, I don't know how this guy can see this sort of stuff. Here's Lenton's language. We conclude that a critical threshold for summer sea ice loss may exist. Uh, they're not so sure about year round, meaning winter. Given that models underestimate the rate of decline, a summer sea ice loss threshold, if not already passed, may be very close and a transition could well occur this century. This is in 2008, 12 years ago. And then he says, the greatest threat is the Arctic with summer sea ice loss likely to occur long before and potentially contribute to Greenland ice shelf melt. And their conclusion warned against using smooth functions, which is what Nordhaus used this paper to defend using smooth functions. And again, identified Arctic sea ice as the first of the two greatest threats. This is the conclusion. Society may be lulled into a false sense of security by smooth projections of global change. So they, I'll suggest, Synthesis suggests 
a variety of tipping elements could reach their critical point within this century, not 300 years away, within this century. And the greatest threats at the tipping of Arctic sea ice and the Greenland's ice. How on earth did Nothouse think this has supported his views? Now, what he was doing, he's, he's come in here with a previous belief, his pre-existing belief, climate change has got to be trivial. Or more correctly, and this is where the assumption and the belief in, the, in equilibrium comes from, that capitalism is so flexible it can cope with anything, therefore climate change can't be a threat. That's fundamentally the thinking. And again, this is a paper back in 1991. Non-climate variables, labor skills, access to markets, technology, swamp climatic considerations in determining economic efficiency. Now, in today's climate, looking across societies, yes, temperature would be a fairly minor determinant compared to everything else. We're talking about changing the climate. That's not even being considered in his thinking. And what he's done over time is progressively reduce the estimate that he provides for damages. In 1992, the function he used, which is quite an awkward function there, uh, ended up with a higher value. Uh, but if you, if you look at uh, every since he started using something resembling a quadratic form, so he's got a quadratic here on uh, uh, multiplying GDP by a fraction, which is less than one. Uh, and then as, as he, he starts off with B uh, being 0045, B disappears in, uh, by 2008. And C goes from 0035 to 0028. Then it goes to 0267, then 236, then 227. So if you look at the temperature change of six degrees, he's gone from saying it's gonna knock off about 15% or 14% of GDP over here to about, uh, what's that, about 12%. And then finally get down to the stage, it's about 8% of GDP. He's been reducing his estimates over time. While the rest of us are worrying more and more about climate change, he's worrying less and less. Now, let's look at reality uh, and the tipping points that we know exist, and we're actually probably seeing them right now. As, as you have a decline in the amount of ice in winter, the Arctic goes from being a reflector of sunlight and therefore not amplifying, but putting the solar radiation back into outer space to an amplifier by turning from white to black absorbing heat rather than reflecting it. And by the way, I just saw this factoid a few days ago. The, because during summer, the Arctic is in 24 hours sunshine, even though it's a lot colder than the equator, the amount of solar energy per day being absorbed in the Arctic is greater than the amount of solar energy absorbed uh, at, at the equator. So the, uh, the Arctic gets more during summer, gets more energy than on, on the average for the year for the equator. So it's much bigger than you might uh, be in, inclined to believe. Now, when that ice disappears, and we're seeing, we're probably seeing it this year, the weather pattern across the whole Northern Hemisphere will shift. And this is the sort of thing we, we talk about. Uh, because the cold air, uh, you know, like you think about the center of a cyclone, the cold air at the middle is dragging air down from the, the, the higher atmosphere and colder, and the, that, that shape, you get this circulation where the pole is basically cut off and it tends to be just around the pole itself. As that breaks down, then you get a weaker vortex, which is more easily bent by weather patterns coming from the other major circulation cells on the planet. And then it will extend much, much further south. And there was a particular day, I wasn't able to find the, uh, the, the uh, meteorological chart to show this, but there was one day in, um, for America last month when California was getting temperatures of 30 degrees Celsius, and just on the other side of this, the, the, the polar vortex had come down and a few hundred kilometers further away, you're getting temperatures of minus 10 on one day. So this sort of craziness is coming out of changing the climatic system for the entire planet. And it's quite possible that 2020 was a tipping point. I mean, 2020 has got everything else to us. Why not uh, a, a tipping point that destroys uh, the climate? because we're now getting this crazy data on uh, what's called the, 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 the cradle, the nursery of ice. Um, this is you're across the whole year. Normally the uh, lactic region of the Arctic Ocean is frozen until about summer, melts and then goes back to being frozen again. And this is the pattern over the last 30 or 40 years. And we find that this year, it still hasn't frozen by the end of October. 
so we don't have the ice we'd expect to normally have. And the extent of ice in the Arctic now is the lowest on record, and it's a big deviation. So we're probably seeing the beginning of this breakdown this year. So a tipping point, the North House told us didn't exist, it wasn't critical and wouldn't happen for three centuries until we had a three degree increase is happening probably this decade at an increase of between one and 1.5 degrees Celsius. And what I find bizarre that, that they can't understand there are different ways to set the temperature on the planet and they matter. So the temperature in any particular location on the planet, you can largely break down to three overall uh, causal factors. Variations in the amount of solar energy, that's the favourite one for climate change deniers to say that's causing our trouble rather than CO2. Variations in the amount of energy were retained by greenhouse gases, and that actually is global warming. And then differences in your location on the planet, mainly how far you are from the equator. So when they did their temperature to GDP studies, they got parameters for the third cause, and they then assumed they could apply those to the second. Now in the paper, which I've attached to this presentation. I said, this is a bit like doing a very careful survey of a mountain in the north-south direction, and then advising on the safety of an expedition to cross it east-west in the night. It's useless. It's entirely the wrong parameters to use for this study. It's got, the, the parameters they use have got nothing to do with climate change. They are changes in temperature and GDP, which occur with no change in the amount of solar energy we're retaining, whereas global warming is increasing the amount of energy we retain in the biosphere. And what scientists expect when they look at it is a huge change in the suitability of the biosphere for human existence. And this is a, I want to do a side by side comparison here. This is from Mark Linus's excellent book that I highly recommend uh, everybody here wants to follow this in detail, buying and reading while you're in lockdown. And that's called Six Degrees, Our Final Warming. Two degrees, he said, will stress human societies and destroy many, many natural ecosystems such as rainforests and coral reefs. And we're seeing that right now. Three degrees, the stability of human civilization is seriously imperiled. Four degrees, a full-scale global collapse of human societies is probable. Five will leave most of the globe uninhabitable biologically, many not just for us, but for other species as well, with humans reduced to precarious existence in small refuges. And if we hit six degrees, we could trigger, this is not a, a, a given prediction, but a potential, a runaway warming process that could render the biosphere extinct and forever destroy the capacity of this planet to support life. Now we have exceeded six degrees above prior levels in the past, so maybe that's getting slightly hyperbolic, but that's what we're talking about. Now you compare it to the neoclassicals. This is from the IPCC. Global losses are between uh, 0.2 and 2% of in income. Uh, a three day, and this is, this is where it's nice to have, uh, they're putting in terms of rates of growth level rather than absolute loss of GDP. A three degree increase, they'd say would drop the rate of growth from 1.5% but 1.485% per year. In other words, rounding error, if you're lucky on normal, on normal yearly statistics. And then six degrees, this is uh, uh, Nordhaus again, a uh, six degree increase will cause an 8% fall in GDP. I'm sorry, we'll be dead by then. So the Mount Linus is left-hand column, and you've got the IPCC and Nordhaus in 1991 and 2018. Now, the whole idea that being indoors is going to prevent you suffering from climate change, uh, it, amongst many other just sheer lunacies about that, it's also ignoring that it's a non-equilibrium process. And we're living through the sum of this right now. The bushfires, We've seen first of all in Australia, now in California, there's a carefully controlled environment being destroyed by a bushfire. And on the right hand side, this is the number of cyclones we've already been through. Okay. So you've got cyclones on one side of a continent, devastating fires on another. This is the transition of the biosphere from what it can support in one climate to what it can support in another. And large parts of the United States and Australia will turn into desert and also Latin America. So what they've been is climate change trivializes. They've mistaken, and, and they've done it by making childish mistakes. And I'm sorry to insult children on that front. Kids often know more than this. You've got to be trained very heavily in a bad era to, to believe nonsense like that. They've mistaken weather for the climate. They've generated utterly spurious empirical data for their models. And they've modeled equilibrium states 
rather than the far from equilibrium process that climate change act is. And they've deliberately misrepresented scientific data. I'm horrified by how Nordhaus treated Lenton's work. Now, these, their expectations are going to be blown out of the water by the real world. And as this happens, I hope people go back and not just look at the uh, exons of the world and say, why did you mislead us? But also look at the economists and say, why on earth did you say this was going to be trivial? And I think what's going to happen is, as it, as it occurs, neoclassical economics is going to go down. Anything is going to destroy it. It's going to be just how bad these predictions are, how misleading they've been. And the type of economy we'll need will make the lockdowns of the COVID period seem trivial. We'll need a war economy, a command economy driven from the government to have any chance of reversing the damage that we've done to the biosphere. And in that process, it's going to be good night capitalism. And I cover a lot more of that in this paper. So I'll leave it there and take questions. Well, amazing. Thanks so much for that, Steve. Um, we've had some questions come in, so I'll pose them to you. Uh, we've had one from Joe Airy Sol, um, who says, agrees that Nordhaus is easy to ridicule, um, but asks if you've read any of the work of Pindyke or Weizmann, and whether you think they've done any better. And I guess it links more broadly to the fact that are there any neoclassical economists kind of doing a better job than Nordhaus? Um, or is it a problem of neoclassical economics itself? Uh, there's some that are doing better. I mean, Weizmann was doing better, but he committed suicide after Nordhaus got the Nobel Prize. And I have a, I've got a feeling that was, I think the two events are related. Um, uh, Gernot Vorner, Wagner, I think, is doing some good work. And he's quite sceptical of, of Nordhaus, but he still works in a, a Ramsey growth model framework. So he's doing decent work. You don't have to be as stupid as Nordhaus. Uh, by being neoclassical, but most of them are in the same cabal. So, um, for example, you know, I think you might all know that I have a very low opinion of Richard Tolt, um, and he he just seems to be bizarrely um, detached from the real world in his arguments. So there's some who do worse work than Nordhaus. Um, Overall, though, I think that the fact that this stuff exists is only possible with neoclassical economics. Uh, I mean, so there's a, a very, very, I have a lot of time for Kamiya Mahadas as a, as a person, lovely human being, unlike Richard Toll. Uh, his most recent paper, I think 2018, simply made a linear extrapolation of the change in temperature and the change in GDP over the last 40 years for the next 80 years when he assumed there'd be a three degree increase in temperature and said so we had a linear projection, no tipping points. And I, my, my comment I made about Kamiya's paper in the, my, my article there is that it's a bit like doing a very careful econometric study of the spe of speed skating and concluding that you should increase the temperature of the ice from minus two to plus two degrees Celsius. Uh, it's, it's just no awareness again of tipping points. So this is a common throughout the literature. So some do better work. I think Chris Hope's um, uh, 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 work enables you to have some um, stochastic elements that occasionally give you extreme outcomes. But overall, I think the framework is useless. And the thing that just horrifies me is none of them have challenged these stupid numbers. None of them have come and said, these are the garbage. We shouldn't be using those numbers. So that I think is possibly just groupthink. The fact that you're in a circle of people, you get refereed by them, um, you, you don't come out and challenge what are clearly absurd numbers that they're using. Now, Weizmann did do that, okay? Uh, there's also De Canio, who challenged it very well. An old, old book by De Canio for that 2003. Um, John Quiggan has had a go at them. There's a few people who have, but I think overall this stuff would never have existed without the neoclassical belief in simplifying assumptions. Yeah, and that, that links to the point I was going to ask about as well. So you said that it's kind of this group thing and mm. there's like these referee circles which become almost the gatekeepers of like these certain subtopics within economics. Mm. Is there, have you, can you think of a way around that? The only what, way what around it done? is, the only way around it is to require replication. Okay. Uh, like for example, the reason, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, one way I'm shocked that I'm the first person to read this stuff in great detail. Like Stephen DeCanio did very good work pulling apart the whole idea of using 
a Ramsey growth model for a climate change, but his critique was a general critique of the applicability of Ramsey growth models to anything, let alone climate change. But nobody that I've seen in the literature dived in and said, where do these numbers come from? Can we trust them? I'm the first person to do that. Um, so that, that horrifies me, but it shows the extent to which refereeing is, is a simple filter because the referee will look at something and say, okay, well, the numbers, yeah, okay, that numbers looks, looks all right without saying, let's dive in and see where this number came from. And if, if you were, refereeing is done as a voluntary activity. It's, and the thing is, particularly as time's gone on, we have, academics have less time to do that voluntary stuff. They're expected to do more of it while they do more admin and everything else. So you think refereeing becomes very slack. Uh, if you actually required replication, so that would mean you have to go and say, well, how is this data generated? Now, when you sit down and generate some of the data the same, we think, this just can't make sense. This is absurd. <clears throat> so replication would be, or having referees from another discipline. So I would think with, certainly uh, when economists are doing this stuff, which is strictly economic, okay, let them have just economic referees. But if you're doing climate change, require a referee who's a climate scientist as well as an economist. Now, if you did that, these guys would have been buried under Arctic ice. They wouldn't have, uh, they wouldn't have been given Nobel prizes for it. Mm. Okay, great. And uh, another question we had was about uh, what can be done about climate change? So asking for some of your perspectives on kind of different things that can be done. They mentioned yeah. degrowth in their question. Um, is this degrowth something that's feasible? Is that something that you would support? Is there any other policies that you think? Yeah, I mean, my overall problem is that uh, it's, it's not just a problem with, we, with economics now, it's a problem with humanity. And that is that we, we don't react before a crisis. People like myself who warn about an approaching crisis get ignored. The, when, there's a, when there's a mainstream that, that gets rewards out of the current social structure, then people on the side saying this can't be sustained just get laughed off because they're not wealthy enough to be taken seriously. <clears throat> Certainly my experience during the global financial crisis. Uh, with, with something like this, and like you look at, the, you look at uh, Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, for example, there were people warning about potential for collapse in different societies who were ignored before the collapse occurred. It's, it's just usual. And so we, because, because the social structure rides on an unsustainable trend, that trend, you get pushed until the trend breaks. You don't say, oh, it's going to break, let's stop. We keep on going until it does break and then react on the other side. Um, so I don't think we'll do anything until it becomes critically obvious that climate change is going to kill us if we don't do something about it. You get that level of, of, of visceral fear about it. Then we might be able to do something about it. Now, to do something about it, we have to have massive degrowth. Uh, we have to go back to the stage where all we consume are the commodities that are necessary to keep us alive fundamentally. The stuff we're making, just designating as essential during COVID is pretty much all that should be produced in that situation to drastically reduce the energy we're consuming and therefore the amount of waste we put in to try to get down to the stage where we can survive on renewable energy alone. And to start, in my opinion, we have to reduce human load on the planet to the stage where we're a fraction of the pressure on the biosphere rather than we are now being one and a half times the biosphere's sustainable capacity is being used by humans alone. Um, so getting there, um, we won't get there in a peaceful fashion. I expect quite a lot of violence and conflict coming out of this, unfortunately. But what I would like to do is to provide, at least put some structures in place that might give us a chance to do something about it. And one thing I am working on now is the idea of carbon rationing. Because think about carbon pricing. That's to put a high enough price and let the market system adjust so we consume less carbon, where the quantity would be worked out by the market. The equivalent way, and even in neoclassical theory, is to set the quantity and let the market determine the price. So what I would say is we know what, we, we, we've got our estimates of the carbon budget to 2030 to, to avoid hitting one and a half degrees or two degrees Celsius. Impose a carbon rationing and give everybody universal or basic carbon credits which could start at the average for each country. So you all got a carbon credit equivalent of the average load for a country. That would mean 95% of people would never, and then when you bought something, you'd pay both in money and carbon credits, a dual price system. The poor, meaning anybody who's been the bottom 95% of the population, 
would never exhaust their credits. The top 5% would exhaust and have to buy carbon credits off the poor. So it'd be an income redistribution scheme, as well as one targeting the people who consume the most carbon, which is the ultra wealthy. And then with that in place, you could then modify the ration over time once it became obvious how critical it was to reduce our load on the planet. So I'm in favor of carbon rationing, not carbon pricing. And I, yes, I think degrowth is essential, but again, we won't do anything about it until it becomes bleedingly obvious that if we don't do it, we're all gonna die. Well, it's pretty depressing, but <laughs> yeah, it seems like that might be the case. Um, another person has asked um, a good question, I think, which is, to what extent is this an academic phenomenon or has it become embedded within government, kind of civil, the civil service businesses? It's certainly embedded in a lot of business. I mean, like Bjorn Lomborg was one of the main um, distributors of this garbage uh, in the business sector. So you'll see him, his, his book's always quoting Nordhaus and Toll, who's a, a good mate and a member of his Copenhagen Institute. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's a bit like, you know, scientists are willing to say that smoking is good for you. Um, and therefore the, the, the smoking companies then happily take the stuff and promote it and push it out. So it's certainly embedded in how a lot of companies think about it. It's embedded in the political circles of politicians who don't take climate change seriously, which is the vast majority of them would be swallowing the stuff. Okay. So I think it's, it's provided support to legitimize trivializing the dangers of climate change. And it's certainly very heavily embedded in society. If it wasn't, if we actually had just scientists telling us this stuff, then we'd be a lot more scared with it a lot more, a lot earlier. And what Nordhaus, of course, Nordhaus's first sortie into this whole area was to disparage and ridicule the limits to growth. Well, that was a far more sophisticated study than anything he's ever done since and far, far more grounded in empirical data than his work was despite him claiming I had no empirical foundation. So um, yeah, it's heavily embedded. And for this reason, we're skeptical about the predictions that uh, we're seeing about the future from scientists. And we're gonna pay for that skepticism. Okay, and I think I'll ask one last question before we wrap up what's been an incredibly informative session. Um, this question is from Daniel. Um, and he says that in his undergrad, Kind of advanced macro course they learn about um, growth models like the solo growth model or overlapping generations models um, and he asked can this even be useful in the 21st century and are there models that you would say should be taught at the undergrad level yeah um, as opposed to those ones they're, they're a waste of time um, solo himself is actually a fairly decent critic of mainstream economics these days by the way uh, and but, but yeah they're useless um, their equilibrium models, their presumed savings causes investment, um, uh, they're just naive. I've just published a new paper in the Review of Political Economy, uh, uh, which talks about the macro foundations of macroeconomics. And if I show that you can actually derive Minsky's financial instability hypothesis in a mathematical form, simply by taking the definitions of the employment rate, the wages share of GDP, and the private debt to GDP ratio, differentiating respects to time and then including the simplest possible relationships. That gives you a, a foundation for a cyclical growth model, which includes the potential for uh, uh, financial crises. And I've also extended it included, to include energy as well, though I haven't published that yet. So it is possible to teach this stuff at the undergrad level. And what you should all be learning is system dynamics. I, I'd actually suggest, uh, you know, Finding somebody who can buy a crib sheet off to pass the economics exams and going and studying system dynamics instead. That's by far a superior way to model any dynamic system, but especially, especially capitalism, given how badly neoclassical economists have modeled it. You know, they're all, it's all a waste of time, I'm afraid to say. That's okay. Pun. <laughs> well, I think we'll end things there. Thank you so much for that. That was incredibly informative, if somewhat depressing, but it needs to be heard.